Thank you for explaining the secret sauce behind the innovation system in Israel. Uh, we now have uh, Mr. Raghu Raman. He is, uh, has had a unique career which has uh, spanned over 30 years. He was an officer in the Indian Army for 12 years with active combat experience in Punjab, Siachen, and Angola as a UN peacekeeper. He's also been CEO of three companies in the Mahindra Group and now with Reliance. And most importantly, he's a very old friend of Israel. We look forward to hearing his insights into working with Israel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So um, thank you for this privilege to speak to, uh, and I'm, I'm glad Sudhir kind of introduced me as a friend of Israel. I've, uh, I've had uh, deep ties with Israel for many, many years, more than, a, I would say, a couple of decades. And um, as uh, the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister pointed out this morning, we have a lot of similarities. But we also have a lot of differences. And friendships can only be made when we understand that the similarities and differences both have to work together. If we base our friendship only on similarities, then each time there is a difference, there will be some sort of a jarring element, like in any relationship. So if you look at our similarities, we were both uh, ancient civilizations. Uh, we had both gone through a very traumatic time in our history. We were both ruled by the British. We were both partitioned by the British based on religious uh, factions. We got our national independence roughly at the same time. Actually, if you look at the long uh, history of our countries, then more or less exactly at the same time. As soon as we got our freedom, we both went to war. We were both attacked by hostile neighbors. The 60s were a very traumatic time for both our countries. You had the 67 war, we had the 62 and the 65 war. And in the 70s, again, at the same time, both of us went through another major war. And guess what? We also gave the two women leaders to the world at more or less the same time. And it was the women leaders who kicked ass of our enemies on both the countries. So that's good for women power. <laughs> we also face the same threats from the same root of terrorism. And as the CM pointed out, when the 26-11 attack happened, the attackers didn't just attack the Indian targets. They had set aside one third of their resources to also attack the Jewish symbol in, in Bombay. And while many of my Israeli friends volunteered at that point of time to give assistance to India, we must not forget that it was an Indian maid who saved the life of an Israeli boy. While we have these similarities, uh, there are some differences also. And I think unless we don't understand the difference and I, I believe job of a good friend is to tell the truth. So I am going to, I've been, as uh, Sudhir pointed out, I've been in the corporate world, I've been a soldier, I've also been a bureaucrat, and uh, I usually prefer, in the interest of time, not to speak like a corporate person or a bureaucrat, but as a soldier, because soldiers usually speak to the point. Our first major difference is our difference in size, and what does that mean? When you look at the size of Israel, there is no way that Israel can have long reaction times. At the narrowest part, I believe the borders are roughly 15 kilometers. So a captain in that border cannot be asking Tel Aviv what orders he should get. He has to act on the spot. And in many ways, that psyche flows not just in soldiering, but also in business, also in policy, also in hierarchy. India, on the other hand, has had tremendous depths. Israel has always had an existential crisis. India, even during its major wars, has never had an existential crisis. In, in many ways, Israel believes in having a very direct approach. India always has a very maneuvering approach. And you can see that in many, many of our cultural art forms. If you look at our martial arts, uh, you look at the Israeli martial arts, Karmagav, it's very direct. If you look at the uh, Indian martial arts of Kaleri Pait, it's much more about posturing, it's much more about form, it's much more about deterrence, and then it leads to the final act. And what does that mean in, in, in when, we, when we work together or we try to do business together? 
one of the most important aspects which has made Israel what it is, and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that as a soldier because when I see, including uh, your Prime Minister, not very many Indians would know that uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister's elder brother was the one who led the raid at Entebbe. We all know the raid at Entebbe, we have studied it, many of us have watched movies, but very few of us know that it was his elder brother and the Israeli Prime Minister himself has been in the Special Forces, he has been in several operations, in one of which he was also wounded. More importantly, he has been a scholar warrior. He has had degrees from IIT and from Harvard while he was doing his soldiering. So in many ways, the Israeli diaspora is part soldier, part academician, part policy maker and part entrepreneur. In India, these four functions are usually done by different groups of people. So the interaction between these four is not as fluid as what you would expect in Israel. So in many ways, hierarchy is part of the Indian DNA. And let me remind my Indian friends here, hierarchy is so much part of our DNA, because even if you look at our mythology, you have the three gods on top. Then under them, you have another set of gods. Then after that, you have these various mounts of the gods, their chariots, their birds, the snakes, they're all worshipped. And then you have the rishis and munis and all of that. And finally comes the human being. So hierarchy is there in our DNA. You can't take it out. But despite that hierarchy, an individual, if he performs penance for years, he can achieve the power to curse the gods and make them come down to the earth and live as a human. And that is why many, many of our entrepreneurs in their own lifetimes have built billion dollar empires. So hierarchy cannot be wished away when you are doing business in India. And I know a lot of uh, experience of business which Israeli friends have is in the U.S. and Europe. And in the U.S. and Europe, when you address a group of people as you guys, you people, and all of that, it's considered okay. In India, I can give you several instances. I've been uh, an advisor to the Israeli Export Council on Homeland Security some years ago. And I remember this incident very clearly. There was this uh, young Israeli CEO who had come with this uh, team. And he was talking to the Indian businessmen, and many of them were fairly senior. They were old and they were experienced. And he was talking to them exactly the way he would talk probably to his counterparts in the US, uh, talking about the features and you guys will benefit from this and you people will be able to do that. At the end of the conversation, when the Israeli team left the room, the chief technology officer who had actually sort of brokered this whole uh, presentation, he asked the CEO, what did you think about the product? And the CEO said, the product is brilliant, but I don't want this man setting foot in my company hereafter. Indians don't buy only features. Indians buy relationships. And that is something that has to be understood very, very well. Otherwise, you will wonder why a superior product is not being chosen and something which is not that good has made the deal. It is not the product that was purchased. It was the relationship which was purchased. And unless we put that aspect in place, you will be at times very unpleasantly surprised. My last advice would be that you should not ever think about an India strategy. Because for the simple reason that if I took one of you Israeli friends and put you in a room with a boy from Kashmir, a girl from Kerala, a person from the Northeast and a person from Rajasthan, they have as much in common with each other as they have in common with you. They don't eat the same food, they don't speak the same language, they don't look alike. A boy from Kashmir can actually pass off as a, as a Caucasian, someone from Kerala can pass off as someone from Africa. It, it's completely, you know, our, our main epic, the Ramayan. Ravan is worshipped in the south, Ram is worshipped in the north. That is the diversity of this nation. So if you try to do an India strategy, that strategy is bound to fail. And lastly, Indians, all things being equal, we prefer to work with friends. This, many, this part many people know. But what most people don't know is all things not being equal also, Indians prefer to work with friends. So I think the first element of any business venture that you want to do in India is to first build that relationship to know that there will be five steps forward, two steps behind, there will be maneuvering, there will be posturing, there will have to be a certain amount of deference paid to the right people, there will have to be a certain amount of give and take and it's only after that relationship is built 
that we can proceed ahead, not on a transactional basis, but in a long-term and a fruitful relationship. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.